Um, I'm Amy Holm. I am the Associate Director of the Sibling Leadership Network, or SLN for short. Um, at SLN, we encourage the involvement of siblings of people with disability, as well as parents, professionals, and people with disabilities. So we have just come off of uh, two days of our national conference and one post-conference session last night. Uh, we have had over 275 people registered for our conference from 35 states and 13 different countries. Um, and I know we have quite a, a group that's here with us tonight from all areas. So either by a um, show of your real hand or your virtual hand, if you would like to let us know if you've attended any part of the conference uh, before tonight, we would love to see who has already been in attendance. Wow, great. Well, welcome back to those who've been with us. It looks like many, if not all, um, and we're so glad that you're here uh, again tonight. Uh, we do encourage you to learn more and get involved by going to the SLN website um, and signing up for our mailing list on the Join Us page. Also, we have just launched an SLN membership. Uh, this is new for us. Um, you can go there to get additional benefits to become an SLN member. It's just $30 for a two-year membership to the Sibling Leadership Network. So I know that Katie has put those um, in the chat box and you can get those there. Uh, also, we have just one more post-conference session um, that is coming up tomorrow night. Um, and Katie will put in the chat box, if you are interested in our kind of finale post-conference session, please feel free to link there. The registration is still available um, for tomorrow's session. And then throughout our time together in the past couple of days through today, uh, you can feel free to share pictures or comments on social media using our conference hashtag, uh, which is hashtag 2021 SLN conference. So just a couple of few quick announcements. Um, we have set this Zoom up so we can all see each other to foster a better sense of community. Uh, please use your best Zoom etiquette while you're with us. When the speakers are presenting, all participants will be muted. Um, when it's time for questions and interactions, you can type into the chat box or raise your hand and you'll be asked to unmute so you can join us in that way. Uh, what we've found is the best view for uh, this presentation is to watch it in speaker view. Um, and for those of you who are unfamiliar, if you go up to the upper right hand corner, of your Zoom box, it says view. Um, and so you can click there. Um, and that way, when the speaker is speaking, um, you can see the, the person who is speaking. So that can be helpful if, if you're interested in viewing it that way. Uh, there are There is a link in the chat box for handouts. Um, this presentation does have some wonderful handouts. Uh, and it, the link was sent in emails beforehand. So you may have already checked them out or printed them out or things like that. But if you haven't, you can look in our chat box now and see those handouts. For those of you who pre-registered for continuing education units, um, we are required to verify your attendance. Um, and so we need to verify your attendance at the beginning and the end of the session. So please make sure that the name on your Zoom square matches the name that you registered for the conference. Otherwise, we have no way to verify who you are. Uh, so take a minute to rename yourself in your Zoom square if you have listed yourself as something other than the name you registered for the conference. And now I'm excited to be done speaking so that I can turn it over to our wonderful presenters, um, I'm going to hand, hand the mic over to our um, lead presenter, Barb Seferis. Barb is a wonderful presenter and has a wealth of experience working in the field of developmental disabilities. Barb is really a true champion for the Sibling Leadership Network. She was a founding member, a former board chair, um, and an endless supporter of siblings. Her perspective as a sibling, a professional, um, and uh, a presenter 
uh, are really helpful to people in the field of disabilities and those of us who are family members as well. And then I know Barb will introduce her, her three panelists as she goes on, Lynn, um, Emma, and Steve, we're glad to have you here as well. Thank you, Amy. <clears throat> First of all, I just want to say how appreciative I am of all of you that are attending. I see some familiar faces and names. And thank you all for joining us from all over the world. It's so nice to have you. I'm also honored to be part of the panel. And Steve and Lynn and Emma will introduce themselves as um, they share information. So I want to thank them for also being part of this panel. So we're here to share information about charting the life course and how we all have used it to empower and support our families, um, both at a professional level and a personal level. We hope to give you in this uh, two hours or less an introduction to charting the life course. We're going to give you some guidance on how the resources can be used and stories of how SIBs have used charting the life course. So a little bit about me, um, I worked, have worked in the IDD field for over 45 years in the Cleveland, Ohio area. Um, my background is a speech language pathologist. I also worked as a service coordinator and as an administrator. I had two brothers. My brother Nick was four years younger than me and was diagnosed with a developmental disability when he was six months old and I was four going into kindergarten. So I grew up with um, having therapists come into our home within a month of his diagnosis. There were no public services. Everything was private, private pay. My brother Jim in his 30s was in an accident and um, it affected his ability to earn a living and also get through his day. So he had an acquired disability because it occurred after age 22. So a little bit about charting the life course, setting the stage. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of charting the life course, but it is the one person centered framework and approach that I know of that was developed by and for people with disabilities and their families. And I think that is such a strong um, advantage of charting the life course. On the right is a map of the United States. There are several states that are part of the national community of practice on supporting families. And if, you're, if you want to know if your state is part of that national community of practice, I suggest that you look at your state's developmental disabilities um, agency or department or your DD council. So charting the life course is really about having conversations with people. It's a different way of thinking. There's no checklists. Um, so I know as families, we're used to seeing lots of checklists and assessments. And it encourages high expectations. So we never want to say to someone, no, you can't. But let's find out together what that means. Let's see what we can do together. And we emphasize the importance of having experiences throughout our life so we know what we want, what we don't want. And it's about having lots of different supports. What it isn't is just a set of tools, a program, and it's for anyone, regardless of age or ability. So I personally have seen families with babies use charting the life course for the, for the parents to um, think about and articulate their vision for their baby. I've also seen families use it when their um, mother is in their, her mid nineties and can no longer speak and share what a good life is for her but the, the adult children have used charting the life course to um, identify a trajectory for their mother's good life. The other thing is, as with any person-centered approach, there are no yes buts. Yes, but my sibling doesn't talk. Yes, but my sibling has mental health issues. Yes, but uh, my sibling is involved with the justice system because we gather the information from the person's words 
and their actions. And as a speech pathologist, I will tell you in 45 years, I have never met anyone receiving supports who someone in their life couldn't tell me what they liked, what they didn't like, what they wanted, what they didn't want, what made a good day and what made a terrible day. The other thing about charting the life course is we value and gather information from multiple perspectives. So we don't look for consensus. We look for let's gather information from anyone that's important to that person. And we talk about person-centered supports within the context of the family and the community. Our core value, uh, some of you may recognize this language, it comes right out of federal law actually, but we want all people in their families to have the right to live, love, work, play, learn, and pursue their life aspirations in their community. And that means everybody, not just the, our family member with a disability, but everyone. So we don't just focus um, on the person or versus the family, but we really look at a holistic approach of that person in the context of their family. Because we recognize, as we all know, uh, the importance of the family in supporting that person. We have eight guiding principles. So this is for all people regardless of age or ability. We recognize the importance of the family system and cycles, and we recognize that when things happen in the family, it doesn't just impact one person, but it impacts the whole family. And all I have to do is remind us all of the impact of COVID. If one person in our family was affected, it affected our whole family. If your kids had virtual school, it did not just impact them, it impacted the whole family system. And we know that the, the system, the family system changes as the family cycles through the lifespan. So the impact on family when a sibling goes away to college or gets married or moves away. Um, we also recognize the importance of life stages and having a trajectory for a good life. And we look at life outcomes and the value of having experiences to be able to identify outcomes. We don't talk about skill areas in charting the life course. We talk about quality of life domains. And we talk about three buckets of support that we all need support in these three buckets. And I'll talk more about them. We also recognize that we all get support from at least five areas, not just from the paid service system. And we recognize the importance of having people with lived experience and families um, active when policy, procedures, um, system change is occurring, not just to give their approval, but to be actually part of the development. And I know that many of us probably have had the experience of, well, you're, a, you know, families and they really mean parents. And oftentimes I've had to say when I'm in um, groups that are looking at policy and procedural change that, hello, I am also a family member as a sibling. So sometimes we have to remind people that family also means sibling. For those of you that are professionals in the United States, you know that we need to promote full access to community life and we need to promote lives that people want to live and that's the CMS settings role. We've probably all seen this club sandwich uh, generation slide and we probably all live it, trying to balance our responsibilities to our own generation, uh, to our siblings, perhaps supporting aging parents and also to our own children. Whoops, excuse me. In charting the life course, we also recognize that our brothers and sisters, our family members, family members play reciprocal roles. We care about people in our family, people in our family care about us. We care for people in our family, people in our family care for us. And it's broken down to help us remember that one person doesn't have to do it all. But as some of you may know, I know that my brother would tell me, I can talk to you, sis, but Jim can't handle it. 
And I would be like, well, Jim should learn how to handle it. Why is it me? Uh, but we may play, siblings in the family may play different roles. One of us may be able to provide that day-to-day -day care. Others may provide financial support. Um, and others may be holding those stories of, of uh, the sibling stories. We want everyone to have a good life. So when we're talking about people receiving supports, we want them to have that civil right of self-determination and we want them to be interdependent. Um, we as families have been told our family members need to be independent. And I think that's so unfair because none of us is independent in our life. If we were, we wouldn't need jobs um, because we would be able to give our, get everything we need for ourselves. We are all interdependent. And we want families to be supported so their strengths and resilience is recognized and supported and enhanced so that they can turn around and provide that caring for and about and love the person in the family. I talked about the three buckets of support. Um, in the blue bucket, think about when you get a medical diagnosis. You know, you go to the doctor and the doctor says you have whatever, high blood pressure, pre-diabetes, whatever. What's the first thing you do? Do you pull out your smartphone and start Googling WebMD? What's the information? We do that all the time, how quickly we pick up our, our smartphones and start gathering information. In fact, during the pre-call, we were wondering what time is it in Nigeria? And one of the panelists said, well, um, it's 11 at night. <laughs> so we do that all the time. We gather information. On the far right, the goods and services. What's out there that can help me? What's, is there a diet? Should I exercise? Is there medication? And then in the middle, we all want to then connect with other people who have similar life experiences. So think about the sibling leadership network. The SLN provides information. It is uh, uh, the website, but also uh, the SLN on Facebook. And Sibnet, the closed Facebook group, provides us all that opportunity to connect and network. And it also provides opportunities to learn about goods and services. I love when a sibling poses a question and someone will ask, what state are you from? What country are you in? And immediately tag another sibling who can help them. We all know that um, it's in law that we have to be person-centered. So what does that mean? It means we want people to have control over the life they want. They're recognized as being valued members of their community and they have both paid and unpaid supports through relationships. In other words, we want our brothers and sisters to have a good life, not just a lot of paper. We talk about important too, and this is in the US, this is in law, all plans have to reflect what's important to people. And, but often we hear just likes and preferences. And when we talk about important to what we're really talking about is what are those things that have to be present in someone's life? Who are the people that are important to that person? And I, I challenge you to think beyond saying just families, family and friends, because none of us likes everybody in our family equally. There are probably some people in your family that you're like, oh my God, if I don't hear from them every day, uh, I get anxious or I'm, I, I'm concerned. There are probably some other people that you're like, Go ahead, boy, if I see them once in 10 years at a wedding, that'll be too much. So don't just be generic. Think about who those people truly are that are important. And think about your life. Think about status and control. A lot of people tell me they want the key to their home. They want, us, they want technology, things to do and places to go. Um, what are your rituals and routines? The fact that I am dressed in front of a laptop at 7.30 at night is really not my typical routine. And at nine o'clock, I'm usually in jammies and very comfortable. So <laughs> I am out of my routine tonight. Think about things to have for your brother and sister and what gives them purpose and meaning and also don't forget culture and identity. So usually I hear the, the um, Holy Trinity when people say what's important to people, they'll tell me going to McDonald's, shopping at Walmart and going bowling. 
And all of those three fall under things to do and places to go. We need to uh, be more in depth. Important four is health and safety, but the piece that we don't always address is what's needed so the person is seen as a valued contributing member of their community. So how are we all seen as valued contributing members of our community? It's because we share our gifts. You know, we share the things that we know. So I, I think I know a lot about person-centered thinking and a lot about charting the life course. So that's a gift that I appreciate the opportunity to share. What are the gifts of the heart? Think about your, your brother or sister. What qualities do they have? And then the gifts of their hands. What, can, what, do you, what are your gifts? Do you cook? Do you bake? Can you fix anything that breaks down? Uh, do you write well? Are you artistic? Are you crafty? What are the gifts of our brothers and sisters of their head, their heart, and their hands? We, one of the resources we're sharing with you is the Charting the Life course portfolio. All of the resources are not only available in the chat through the links, but you can find everything also on lifecoursetools.com and that website, uh, we'll, we'll be sharing that with you. On the front of the portfolio is a, is a resource called the One Page Person Center Description. And I love it. Um, because it makes us stop thinking and talking about the person that we love in, in the, within the parameters of their disability. So if I always, if I talk to a group of siblings, usually they say something like this. I have a 45 year old brother who has um, seizures and cerebral palsy and lives in a group home and goes to a day program. And I thank them and I say, thank you very much. You just told me what made them eligible for services but you forgot to tell me one detail and that's their name. Who are they? Who is this person that you love? And maybe you like them, maybe you don't every day, but who is this person? So there's three sections on the person-centered description and I'm gonna go through each one, but I tell people don't use this, use a Word doc with text boxes so you can add a photo or you can add graphics that are meaningful to your brother or sister. So the first section is what do people like and admire about your brother or sister or yourself? And we're asking about qualities, not activities. So lots of people will write activities. They're a special Olympics athlete, they're a swimmer. Well, that's what they do, but who are they? Are they competitive? Are they... Um, uh, athletic? Um, are they strong? Are, or, or do they just participate in Special Olympics because they like uh, the social? They're just social and they like being around lots of people. So think about it. If, you, um, uh, if you're a coach uh, or a teacher uh, in your faith-based community, or maybe you volunteer at your kid's uh, school, you don't say, I teach kids how to throw a ball. <laughs> That's the activity. What is your quality? Unfortunately, when I talk to people with lived experience, the only thing they share with me when I say, what do you like about yourself? What do people like about you? Is they tell me they're nice. And so I. Um, I consulted with Dr. Google, PhD, and I looked up human qualities. And so I share this slide to remind us all that probably the brothers and sisters that we love and sometimes like um, have more qualities than just being nice. The second section of the person-centered description is what's important to, the, to your brother or sister, to me. And you can use the life domains. You can use those eight areas I just talked about. You know, who are the important people? What is their rituals and routines that are important to them? Um, you know, three of us are from Ohio. And I will tell you that on the days that the Ohio State University plays football, the city of Columbus shuts down and people all over Ohio are tuned into the game. So if people don't list that watching football or whatever sport is important to them, maybe they're not thinking broadly enough. 
And then the last section is how to best support me. And it's not a list of needs, but it's what other people need to do. So look at the language. When you teach me, one woman who has um, uh, a job wrote her one page description for her boss, her employer. And she said, when you teach me something new, tell me, show me, watch me, and then tell me how I'm doing. And I told her, you don't need your a job coach. You just told your employer how to accommodate you so that you can do a good job. Uh, don't tell me what to do. Give me at least two choices. One mother wrote, remind me to wear headphones in a noisy place. And don't talk to me like a child. That's something my brother, Nick, would often say to people. So I want you to think about a one page description for your sibling. And I want you to write down right now, you're gonna share in a breakout room soon, but I want you to write down what are a couple of qualities that you love about your brother or sister or other people have said, boy, what we love about him or her is. And then I want you to write a couple things that are important to them and think of those eight areas. And then for best way to support, think about if you had two minutes to give somebody a quick snapshot, they're gonna come in, they're gonna support your brother or sister. In two minutes, tell me one or two things I need to make sure I do so that they are comfortable and feel safe with me and I can support them well. So I gave you some lead time, write those things down, a couple of, a couple of things in each one. Let me show you a one page person center description for my brother, Nick. You notice it doesn't say Seferis. This is not a demographic sheet. He liked to be called Nick the Greek. Um, Nick passed away, but when we asked him, what do you want on your marker? He said, Nick the Greek. And so on his marker, it says Nick the Greek. I used quotes, but that's because Nick said it. Please don't ever use the pronoun I or my or quotes if the person did not say it, other, otherwise we're committing libel. So you see under great things about Nick, uh, my mother who is 96, first thing out of her, her mouth is ornery. So that's what's on his, but look at that, he's intuitive. Look at what's important to him. I tried to include people, things to do, places to go, culture, um, listening to his music loudly, and going to the bar and having his 7-7 watching the Indians games. How to best support. Use a teaspoon to feed me, put it on the left side between my teeth. Uh, don't give me fruit or juice. I can hear and understand you, don't yell. Use, or use a parent voice, I could be old enough to be your father. So those are what other people need to do to support him. Nowhere there does it say, I have spastic cerebral palsy and I can only voluntarily move two fingers, okay? It tells you who this human being is. So I gave you enough lead time. <laughs> We're now gonna put you in breakout rooms of, let's do three people in a breakout room. We're gonna give you four minutes, that's all you need. And I want you to introduce your sibling and use sentences like this. My, first tell us who you are. I'm Barb, I'm from Ohio. My brother, Nick, um, is Nick. What people like about him is he was ornery, he was honest and he was intuitive. What's important to him is our Greek culture, talking to me every day, how to best support him, feed him with a two spoon, put the food on the left side of his mouth. I think that took me about 15 seconds. So introduce yourselves and then introduce us to your sibling using the three areas of the one page person center description. And we'll see you in four minutes. Bye. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Please know that the breakout rooms are short why? Because we want to give you an opportunity to think, to practice, but also um, to come back so we can cover more information. You're not going to finish, and we know that, but we also want you to have the opportunity to engage with each other. So thank you for doing that. 
So just a reminder, when if you're going to make a one-page person-centered description with your sibling, we do it with the person, uh, you want to make sure you identify who's going to be reading this. What's the purpose of it? And I especially um, emphasize this, especially because of the last year. Um, a lot of families have made one-page person-centered descriptions. A lot of people receiving supports have developed their own one-page person-centered description. I tell families, one page, why one page? Everyone will read one page. I don't know how long your plans are that your brothers and sisters have, um, but in Ohio, when I ask families, they tell me anywhere from eight to 80 pages. And I think 80 pages, that's a mortgage. Um, <laughs> who reads that? So we wanna keep it to one page. I tell families, keep multiple copies, put one in a plastic sheet protector. Families put it on the refrigerator. Advocates I know have put them in frames and hung them on their wall. And, and when a provider comes in their home says, read my one page before you talk to me. Uh, you need to know who I am. And always put a photo. I always think that when you add a photo, it's, it becomes a person. And the photo of my brother was in a car, a convertible, not his sister's convertible, but a friend's convertible. Why? Because he loved cars. And so that immediately became a conversation point. If people saw the picture of Nick in a convertible, hey, Nick, is that your car? Where'd you get that car from? Oh. And immediately it put him at ease because somebody had a way to converse. Parents of young kids have put Barney or Thomas the Tank or Grover or anybody that is meaningful, Legos, anything on the one page because it's a conversation starter. Lots of adults put um, sports mascots. And this past year, it became really critical to start thinking about what if my loved one is hospitalized? What if I'm hospitalized? What if I can't be there? And I know that we wouldn't want to leave our brothers and sisters, but I've kept bedside vigils with both of my brothers, my mother, my partner, who both had strokes. And I will tell you, the, the minute you leave to go use the restroom is the minute somebody walks in that room. And so how can you share this information? I learned very quickly, you do not give it to the nurse because it'll go in the record and nobody will ever read it. So do a one, think about a one page person centered description for hospitalization. And I tell people, put it in a plastic sheet protector and put it above the bed. So anybody walking in the room can see and have some information about what to do. Under important too, it would be totally different because now you're talking about what's important in the hospital. So having a cell phone, um, having the chaplain visit, do they need to have their stuffy or their blanket or their iPad with them? I always would tell people when my brother was hospitalized, leave the TV on, he can't operate the remote, just leave it on so he has something to listen to. How to best support, and I learned these all the hard way. Um, show them how to use the call button, how to position them, how to give them medication. Um, I would always say contact Barb and I would put my cell phone so I can talk over a decision and how they express pain. So here's Nick's hospitalization, one page person center description. Great things about him are the same, but important too, I was not Nick's guardian, but I, I supported him and supported decision-making. So if he needed to make a decision, I told him, have them call me. Uh, an important one, how to best support, I can't feel pain on my right side. I can't tell you how many times people would come in the room and they would say, Nick, on a scale of zero to 10, what's your pain? And he would say zero. And I would say, stop, <laughs> that's only on his left side. He can't feel pain on the right side. And that's where he has lesions. Don't, that is not an accurate response. He can't feel pain. People use one page person centered descriptions for lots of uh, reasons and I'm not gonna read them. And what we wanna see, this is a trajectory. 
It indicates what we want, what we don't want. What we want is people to use a one-page person-centered description that it describes the person. It's developed with the person, with the family. It's not demographic information. It's not a list of services and it's not disability centric. Again, we want people to get better lives, not just better paper. So what does a good life mean? You know, that, that could be a cliche. Oh, we want everybody to have a good life. But what's a good life for any of us? A good life is we have dreams. I heard somebody once say, without dreams, all we get is what we're given. And we don't want our brothers and sisters and our families that all they get is what they're given. A good life is we have people who believe in us. Um, I grew up in a time when women didn't go to college. And I had some people who said, why do you want to go to college? You're female. You don't, go be a secretary. And I was like, oh, my gosh. But I also had people in my life who said, it's really important to you. You want to be a speech pathologist. Um, you know, you should go, you should do, you should apply, you should. Um, and I had people who even offered to help me if I needed the help. We have a good life because we're respected. We have a good life because we have more good days than bad, that we have control over a life and we feel healthy and safe. So in charting the life course, we ask people to think about what is a good life for them. And we call it a trajectory. You see two arrows, one going towards the bubble, and that's what a good life is. And those are generic, a good life. We'll talk more about what we really need to write in there. And also a vision of what we don't want. When I ask families, sometimes it's hard for them to identify what a good life is, or they'll give us system good life. You know, things we've taught them to tell us. I want them to be independent. I want them to have a job in the community as opposed to where. I want them to live in the community as opposed to where. And so I ask families, tell me what it looks like. What does independent look like to you? What does that mean? When I ask, and sometimes they can't come up with it, but they can tell you what they don't want. And usually families say, I don't want them to be lonely. I don't want them to be taken advantage of physically, sexually, financially, emotionally, psychologically. When I ask people with lived experience, what is your good life? What do you want? Most common answer, boyfriend, girlfriend, my own place. I want to get money. I want my own money so I can buy things I want. I want that money so I can go on vacation. Most common answer of what I don't want is drama. And I have to ask people, what does that mean? And it means lots of different things. Um, I don't want staff in my face all day. I don't want people bossing me around. Uh, I don't want to be with the same people I live with and go to day program with. I don't want to be around so many loud people. Here's an example of Ben's good life. You see the dark black arrow goes up to the vision of a good life. Now this trajectory was developed by Ben and his parents. And you see some generics, you know, family, friends, tattoos, you see a picture. And then you see this blue arrow on the bottom because we don't all have a life that goes straight up to the good things. We have detours in our life. And all I have to say is pandemic. You know, who knew 15 months ago, 15 months ago, 16 months ago, our, good, our vision of a good life changed from March 2nd to March 30th of 2020. And our life went down towards that box of what we don't want. When that happens, what we need to focus on is how do we help people get back on track to the life they want, just like we all did. How are we gonna do grocery shopping? How are we gonna stay healthy and safe? Um, do we have enough toilet paper? Uh, do I have Clorox wipes? How am I gonna get those? How am I gonna see people? How many of us had to teach older family members how to use FaceTime and um, yeah, and Zoom? 
I'm looking at your head. I'm looking at the top of your head. Can you move the camera down a little bit? We did it. We all had to do it. And we also need to remember, a lot of us may have brothers and sisters that have reputations. You know, they, something happened to them 30 years ago and people keep bringing it up. And we need to advocate that the past is the past and it was a lesson. And I hope your friends don't introduce you as, here's my friend, Mary. 40 years ago, she had a relationship with someone who really took advantage of her. So, you know, she's not good at social relationships or 30 years ago, she maxed out her credit card. That's the past. Hopefully it was a lesson and let's move on. Let's not keep our brothers, let's not keep people stuck in that bad reputation. There are two trajectories that you could use. One is just for exploring. What's a good life? What do we want to avoid? If people have difficulty coming up with outcomes, then um, in charting the life course, we talk about life domains. These are not skill areas. These are areas about a good quality of life. If I ask you if you have a good quality of life, I don't think any one of you is gonna tell me, yes, I have a good quality of life. I brush my teeth three times a day. I know how to do my laundry. I take a shower or a bath every day uh, and I change my clothes. Those are skills. The life domains are interconnected with each other. And think about it. When you meet someone, what's the first thing you ask them? What do you do, right? Where do you live? Oh, I know people who live in, in that area. Do you know so-and-so? Have you checked out the gym that's new in your area? Or are you walking in the parks? There are nice bike trails there too. Um, don't you feel safe there? It's a great neighborhood. You can walk around. Uh, the restaurants are within walking distance and you could sit on the patio, blah, 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 blah. And then you might ask them, so what else do you do? Uh, do you volunteer? Um, and by asking in whatever that was, a minute, I've covered all the life domains. So think about it. This is the way we engage with people. This is the way we reflect our good life. If someone said, do you have a good life, Barb? I'd say, boy, you know what? I'm retired and I get to share my passion about charting the life course and supporting and empowering families. Um, I love where I live. I live in a great area. My neighbors are wonderful. They look out for each other. They care about each other. I, uh, pre-pandemic, I went to the gym <laughs> four times a week. Um, I feel safe. Uh, I know that my neighbors look out if I get packages and I'm not home. And I get to advocate and um, volunteer to support families. We don't talk about skills, we talk about these life domains. So what I want you to do now, and Katie's gonna get ready to put you in breakout rooms, I'm gonna give her a little lead time. What I want you to think about is what is a good life for you? And what do you want to avoid? And then I want you to share, and, and it could be very quick. A good life for me, Barb, is that I continue to, to be able to advocate with and for people with disabilities and their families. A good life for me is that I have, um, uh, I can consult and I can say no to things that I don't want to do. And I can say yes to things that I do want to do. What do I want to avoid? I want to avoid getting sick. I'm a daily caregiver of a family member who's high at high risk. And so I want to avoid getting sick. Um, if my brothers were alive, my perspective of a good life for each of them was that they had control over their life. And what I wanted to avoid for both of them, because both of them passed away, both of them lived with a lot of pain. And I really wish we could have tempered their pain levels. So in your breakout rooms, Katie's going to put you in breakouts again. For let's do three people, four minutes. Just what's a good life for you? What's a good life for your sin? And what do you want to avoid? Thank you. See you in a couple in four minutes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks. Um, I think the most uh, profound statement I heard was 
somebody in my chat room said these are the this is my good life this is what i want to avoid and then i said what about your sibling and she went the same <laughs> and i was like yes <laughs> so um, this is an expanded trajectory or trajectory for planning. You see six boxes, what we want, what we want to avoid, but also in charting the life course, we recognize that past experiences help us move towards that good life, move towards what we want to avoid. Um, and then the middle box is what do we need to do next to stay on track, to go towards that life we want, and to also avoid the life we don't want. And I want to check my next slide before, yes. So think about the, the pandemic. Our life changed in, in a couple of days. So what was your good life? Was it to stay well? What happened in the past, your past life experiences that help you survive or live through the pandemic? Did you know how to use Zoom? Did you know how to use all the different platforms? Or was that something in the middle that you had to learn. Um, did you have masks? I did not have a mask. There was no, there were no masks to be had. However, I did have Clorox wipes because I buy them anyway, and I did have toilet paper, so I felt good for a while. Um, but what happened in your past that maybe impacted your trajectory? Um, do you live with someone who was high risk? Were, do you yourself have a condition that you were like, oh my gosh, I've got to be careful. And then in the middle, what did you do? Did you start learning how to shop online? Did you learn the different platforms? Um, and then what did you want to avoid? I wanted to avoid large crowds. They kind of scared me. I didn't go to the gym. Even when it opened, I was like, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, so we all do this. We all plan our lives this way. We think in this way. It's not just something we use uh, with people with disabilities. So the trajectory helps identify personal outcomes. And you can have your parents do a trajectory. You can do a trajectory from your perspective for your brother or sister, and they can do one. Like I said, we like getting multiple perspectives. It's okay. And it could, you could do a trajectory for just one domain. Where are they gonna live? What are they gonna do during the day? Or it can be short-term or long-term. A friend of mine, um, Brenda in South Dakota, uh, did a trajectory with her son, Derek, who received supports, thinking that, you know, we all thought this pandemic was going to be over by summer. So she goes, let's do a trajectory from April till September, because then it'll be gone and it'll be done. So <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. But it could be short term, it could be long term. And I'm going to go uh, quick because I want the other people to also share. This is the vision tool. I love giving this to families um, and people with lived experience. In the first column, you see the icon of each of the domains. In the second column is a little description. What does it mean? The third column, people can write down, gee, where would I like to live? An apartment, a house with somebody by myself. And then the fourth column is priority. And I don't really worry about that. Um, but I love the fact that the icon is there because the tools are easily um, understandable to people of all abilities. I'm going to keep going. We also sent you the link to this booklet. What I love about it is in the middle, there is a two page spread for each domain from the life stage of prenatal and infancy, all the way up to aging. So it gives you considerations, things to think about. I always tell family, look at the age, the life stage that your loved one is in, but also look at the stage before. Did we address those things? And also look at the next life stage. How can we prepare for the next life stage? So I'm not gonna ask how many of you are thinking about retiring. And how many of you that are thinking about it are at least 10 years away? You don't start thinking about retirement the month before you retire. You start thinking about it way ahead. Am I going to have enough money? Do I open an IRA? Whatever. <laughs> 
on lifecoursetools.com, all the resources are free. You can download them and print them. There are also these quick guides. So I like giving families the quick guide for the life stage that they're in. So if your brother or sister is in transition 14 to 22, you might want to download the transition to adulthood four pagers because it gives you everything to consider in all six domains. So we want people to have a trajectory because we don't want them to just get what we give them. We want them to have a dream. It should never be done in a team meeting. So it should never, hopefully no one pulls it out and says, let's do a trajectory during your IEP or ISP meeting, because it's really something that needs to be done when the person feels comfortable, when they have time to think, when the family has time to think. A lot of parents have told me they do the trajectory before the meeting so that when they are in that IEP meeting or ISP or IFSP meeting, um, and I apologize for those of you outside the United States, those are all initials of different planning meetings that people have in the, in the States, um, that they can actually share their thoughts and not feel like, oh, I, I've got to come up with something. Oh my gosh, what am I going to say? The last resource on that portfolio is the integrated star, and I'm going to go through it. There are five sections. So let's think about, you can use it to brainstorm or problem solve. We always start with personal strengths and assets. Why? Because we recognize that everybody has strengths and we want it to be a strengths-based approach. So think about vacation, something that maybe some of us are still yearning to go on. <laughs> if you wanna go on vacation, think about your personal strengths. You know where you want to go. You know what you want to do. Um, you can save money. You have money. Who can help you? Well, not just family and friends, but maybe people who have gone there or people who know the area. So people who can help you related to that specific outcome. Technology. What technology do you use when you plan a vacation? Do you use a GPS? Do you use MapQuest? Do you use TripAdvisor? Do you use, um, I don't know what else, hotels, websites, uh, Airbnb? I always pack my coffee maker because I like my coffee in the morning when I get up. I don't wanna get dressed to go get it. I want it before I have to go leave the room. So I pack a coffee maker. That's my technology. Community resources, Do you, you can go to the library and get information. You can go to a travel agent. And then eligibility specific. We all have eligibility specific supports. I'm of the age now where I get senior discounts and I'm proud to use them. Um, but I'm eligible because of my age. Also, I get hotel, I belong to hotel um, rewards programs. So every so often I get a free night. I'm not going to put you in breakout rooms. I want to give my uh, co-presenters an opportunity to share. We shared this resource with you. On the left side going down are the life domains. Across the top are the five areas of the integrated star. So if you are problem solving or trying to brainstorm, what resources can help my brother or sister or my family? You've got a chart that helps you start thinking about things not just in the service system, but in those four other areas, personal strengths, relationships, technology, community resources. We start with personal strengths. We always end the brainstorming with what's, uh, what are the eligibility specific supports. The integrated star helps us brainstorm, problem solve. And we always start with personal strengths, not eligibility. And I'm going to turn it over to Lynn. So Lynn, just tell me when to advance the slides. Okay, thanks, Barb. Hold on one second. I'm going to ready my voice. Okay, thank you, Barb. Um, I, good evening, everybody. And thanks for, for being here tonight. I'm, and Barb, thank you for asking me to be a part. Um, my name is Lynn. Callaway, I'm a silver sieve from Ohio. 
<clears throat> excuse me, I'm recently retired. And I am uh, number three in a lineup of four daughters. Um, the youngest of them is Leah. She's number four. Leah was born in 1967, and um, that predates 95-142. But um, I, none of that mattered to me. I was just thrilled because one of the things I always wanted was a little sister. My mom was 40 at the time. And she was not necessarily as excited about all of this as I was. So here comes Leah Dawn into the world. Uh, she, she was adorable, cute as a button. Um, she talked really early. She had a lot to say, and that's still true today. That's actually one of her strengths. She's a social creature. Um, but what my mother noticed was that she was fussy. She didn't sleep much. Um, she, uh, she didn't like touch. Um, and she was missing a lot of developmental milestones. And, and the good news was that, that was the bad news. The good news was she had three big sisters who were going to advocate for her. And she had a mom who was a beast of an advocate. There was not much that my mother was not determined to see happen in Leah's life. So she found friends who had children with disabilities. She had a circle of African-American women who had children with disabilities. We did, not have, we did not have Google. We did not have Facebook. I don't know how she found these people, but she found them and they created a community. Um, they talked about what was available, where their children might go to school. Um, they even had a member of the group who uh, knew a little bit about the employment world. So all of these young, and they all were girls, all of these young ladies went to school. Leah went to school. Uh, like Barb said, it was private pay or, um, and I think Leah spent a lot of time in, um, in a private school. She went to, um, to the Catholic school system and, and graduated from a Pentecostal high school. It, she found a way. Um, after that, uh, Leah had an opportunity to explore. She went to a community college in uh, Iowa for just a hot second. There was a special, I'm using air quotes, that's what they called it, a special program for people with disabilities there. Um, I really, I really felt like my mother did everything she could to lay the foundation that she knew. Her head was as high as her experience would take her vision for Leah's life. And everything went really well until Leah told my mother that she wanted to move out at the age of 37. My mother has said, no to pediatricians who wanted to institutionalize Leah. She said no to doctors who suggested therapies that were just way too, just way too unbelievably way out. And believe me, when Leah said she wanted to move out, mom said no, absolutely no. That just wasn't on her radar. Well, Leah, eventually, after I advocated and helped to find friends and people who had experienced living on their own, I'm a professional or was a professional in the DD field. So we had examples to share. And, and when she got a chance to see that Leah could be comfortable in that setting, mom helped Leah find an apartment right across the street from her and my dad. So she could literally watch her out of the window. Um, Leah could come across the street. Mom could do laundry with her. They cooked together. She knew if Leah's clothes were wrinkled. She knew, <clears throat> pardon me, she knew um, when Leah came and went, it was very comfortable for mom. Leah was well cared for. She went to church with my parents. She traveled with my parents. All of those things happened in Leah's life um, 
as my mother was able to see that on the horizon. Um, my mother passed away one month after Leah moved into her current apartment. Um, she was now living in a more specialized HUD subsidized apartment. Um, it's an apartment building in the heart of a really vibrant, young, hip community in uh, Cincinnati. Um, the cost of the housing in the neighborhood is high, so that usually is that usually equates with safety, and uh, and it's not affordable for her without a subsidy. Um, eligible residents have a range of intellectual, physical, or developmental disabilities, so she lived with some paid supports in that apartment for the last 12 years. Um, she's like was in walkable distance from work. It was, a, in my mind, a perfect living arrangement. Um, and then in 2019, Leah told me that she wanted to move. And I certainly had, at that moment, a lot of empathy for my mother. <laughs> it's like, I'm not gonna say no though. What I'm going to do is pull out these charting the life course tools and we're going to take a look at the trajectory. I want to know what she's thinking. I want to know what's driving this decision. So we pulled out the trajectory sheet and we took a look at what she wanted. Um, apparently, Leah wanted to live closer to me. And I found that to be a bit of a surprise. I thought she was very happy where she was. She was feeling concerned that because of health issues that she has, she's diabetic and her numbers would, would drop. And she was very afraid that I might not be able to get to her in time. So she said she wanted to live closer. She said she wanted to feel safe and stay healthy. That, that, all, made, that all made sense. Um, she's in a walkable community. So I mean, that, I, that was a wash. Um, she told me she wanted to grow as an artist. Um, she wanted to keep volunteering at an art studio where she was working. Um, and all that factored in because I didn't know how we were going to do that if she moved, but we weren't ready for that part of the discussion yet. She wanted a job where she felt valued, the right companion, and she told me that she wanted more time with the other three sisters. Uh, well, all three of us. She, was, she and I spend a great deal of time together. And, um, and like Barb mentioned, what Leah said she didn't want, no drama. No drama. Um, unfortunate, the unfortunate thing about this living arrangement is that people do sometimes have behavioral outbursts and it, it's upsetting to her. Um, one thing I was very surprised about was her fear to, to walk alone. She's never been afraid to walk alone. I'm so glad we had this conversation because I learned things about her that I sort of assumed that I knew. Um, and she said she doesn't want to be lonely. And it, it, that's, that's a heartbreaking thought for me. I don't ever want her to be lonely. So um, we, we took a look at this. We started with the trajectory sheet and then we moved to the star, the problem solving star that Barb mentioned, the integrated star. And in 2019, we were just trying to get a handle on how to address this issue of where will Leah live? Um, we started with, well, I'm gonna, Barb, forgive me, but I'm gonna start with community-based <laughs> because I don't want, because that's how my page is set up. So um, what assets did her community offer? Well, it, it, as I mentioned, um, grocery and pharmacy are, are close by healthy food choices for someone who's diabetic. She was in walking distance of a Kroger and a fresh market. Of course, in between those two places was a dairy farmer and, a <laughs> and other places I wish you would not go, but it was really convenient. Um, there's entertainment. They had, um, in 2019, they had concerts in the park. There were music, uh, music events all the time. Um, it was a diverse and inclusive community. Um, so those things seem like 
a good reason to stay in my mind. But Leah was exploring. In terms of technology, we had set up a Google Home so she could set alarms for her meals and it, it would help her with meal planning. She could ask it to add things to her grocery list. Um, at that time, she was using an Uber. I would call it, it would pick her up, get her where she needed to go. Um, there was a GPS medical alert um, that she was using, um, which was very helpful if she got into trouble in the community, it increased her independence. Um, she was using a continuous glucose monitor. I could see those numbers from where she was. Um, what did she need at that time? We were working on remote, mo remote supports. Um, having um, a remote contact reach out to her each day to check in at various points and keep her on schedule. Um, her personal strengths, Leah is a talker. Um, she can ask for help. She can use a cell phone. Um, she is in her ability to assess her both her emotional and physical state gave me a lot of confidence that if something was going off track, she might tell me. Uh, she was working out with a trainer. Again, social butterfly. Um, and she was volunteering. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. In terms of um, her relationships, uh, I'm an advocate and uh, of Leah's. We are in touch with each other every day. So she has that support. I'm taking her to doctor's appointments. Um, she's connected to more family than I am. Um, she has friends that in the community, she has friends in the places that she hangs out. If I go to the coffee shop with Leah, everybody in the coffee shop knows Leah's name. Um, and I have to ask her to introduce me. I think she might be ashamed, I'm not sure. But um, she's known in her community. Um, what does she need? She needs a little more one-on-one -on -one time with family, as she's told us. And, um, and we, as all of us are aging, are really intentional about finding and curating like natural supports especially those that are younger than us and who might be able to kind of step into that role as we pass on. Um, and then the eligibility piece, which I always say for last, um, she receives DD services. Um, she has an on-site personal care support um, through the uh, residential uh, agency that supports her. Um, she has benefits. Um, but in order for her to move, it was clear that she needed a voucher um, Leah did not have enough income to support that living arrangement. Next slide, please, Barb. So this is Leah's trajectory worksheet from 2021, two years later. In that time, um, in 2020, during the first three months of the pandemic, Leah moved in with us my husband and I, it was really wonderful. Um, it was a horrible, horrible time, but it was the first time we lived together since we were kids. So we got to know each other very differently. And um, although I am very sure that I got on her nerves with my plans and structure and recommendations and suggestions, my healthy meals and uh, Leah, poor Leah, she really was just about done with my husband and I. <laughs> at the end, at the end of June, um, she she moved out. Um, she stayed with us until we felt like she understood what was going on with the pandemic, that things were managed well in her residential setting, and that she was, you know, um, able to be supported remotely. And uh, that, was, that was a big uh, shift for all of us. Um, we got to talk more. At early 2021, we were having a conversation and she told me, you know, I think I want to do another trajectory sheet. I, I'm, you know, I, I, don't, I, I said, oh boy, what's coming now? <laughs> but she said, no, I've been thinking about moving and I'm, I'm not sure I want to. So we, we approached it again. Um, and here's, 
here's what changed during her life experience during the pandemic. She said, she's not necessarily interested in living closer to me and my husband. She said, I wanna live closer to my friends. I really missed my friends. I didn't see them for the better part of, it was almost four months actually. And she said, I, I think I wanna live close to them. And that was, that was a great discovery. Um, she still wants to feel safe. She still wants to live in a walkable community. She did tell me she doesn't really want to work anymore. And um, I'm, I'm still toying with that one, but I think she got just real relaxed during the pandemic. And she said, I don't, I don't think I want to work. We, we, that's a whole nother star that I'll do another time for you, Barb. <laughs> but um, she wants to grow as an artist, but she, she wants to stay connected to that, that art community in a different way. Um, she still feels, wants to feel valued wherever she is. She wants the right companion. She still wants more time with us. But in the what she doesn't want for her life, she, she added that she didn't want too many people directing her. I feel like that was a, a, a lesson directly from her pandemic time with me and my husband. I, I, I kind of picked up on that. Um, and she also said, and I did, I mistyped um, to be treated with disrespect. That is clearly a typo. She doesn't want to be treated. Um, yeah, she doesn't want, she wants to be treated with respect. Um, Barb, next slide. So we did an integrated star to look at this aspect of her life, this, this change. We really needed to look at housing again um, in this new context. Um, a couple of things that I just want to point out about the Charting the Life course tools in our usage of them is that we learned that life isn't linear. Things don't always go. I mean, the trajectory looks like this, but that's not always the way life goes. I think you pointed on that bar, pointed, pointed, it at, um, pointed that out. Leah said that, um, I, I, I don't think I want to move. I would like to stay here, but there was something making her unhappy about that apartment. So we addressed that. Under um, community-based, um, she still has all of those, um, yeah, she still has grocery and pharmacy nearby, healthy food choices nearby. They actually, while she was gone, they were working on a walking trail. So there is a, there's additional places for her to exercise now. Um, when I was able to get into her apartment, we cleaned it out. We decluttered, um, got it painted, changed some furniture, gave her a look, just a slightly different, she said what she wanted to be in that apartment. Quite honestly, when she moved from her first apartment, whatever she had just ended up there. This is, this is her space now. These are not things that my mom bought for her apartment. These are things that Leah chose for her apartment. Um, in terms of remote support, well, she still has Google Home. Um, we do have a new monitor, which is really amazing. Um, the Dexcom G6, um, it's simplified. I can see it. Um, her physician can follow her numbers. So I have support in supporting her. And um, she now has um, remote supports through the residential agency that operates her building. And they can call me to help me track Leah's um, not well-managed um, diabetes numbers or her glucose levels. Um, she does still need a GPS watch. We almost had it so that when she's in the community, if she has an emergency, she can ask for help. Um, we're trying to upgrade that. Uh, it, her personal strengths and assets are still the same. She's still a great reporter. She is still um, calling me eight, nine times a day to tell me everything that is going on in her life. And most of the time, I'm really happy to hear all about it. Um, 
she has a new cell phone so we can FaceTime now. It is awesome. It's really, it's helpful talking to her in the mornings. Um, I think she has matured. I don't know what, I, I don't know, there's just been some growth. So she's not as anxious. Um, she's better at managing, a little better at managing her anxiety and identifying what's going on with her feelings. And so she has some strategies now for managing that acting out behavior that happens in her building. Um, and she has a well-coordinated healthcare team now. Um, she's still a social butterfly. All of those things are still the same. Um, but under um, eligibility, Leah has, um, you know, it, she's, uh, she's now able to use her, she needs her bus card again so that she can get back out into the community. Moving back out into the community has been really difficult for her after the pandemic. So how did charting the life course help? Um, it elevated the concern to a question that needed to be explored. Um, the answer emerged. Um, it, it wasn't determined by me or by other people, but as a result of our discovery, it gave her agency. My, my, of course, I, I knew that it wasn't likely that we were going to find housing that Leah could afford. Um, this conversation with her helped her to make that decision sort of on her own. And we'll probably come back to this again someday, but for now, we've got the answers. Um, as a matter of fact, um, after we documented her thoughts using the uh, STAR, her SSA was directing her to places she might want to consider living in. And Leah took out her star and explained to her, I was so proud of her. She took her star out and she told her, you know, this is, this is kind of what we're working on right now. This is what I want. And, um, and so no, thank you. Um, I really appreciate that it took what would have maybe been a, a power struggle for us. Leah, that's just, you know, you can't afford that. There's just, it elevated it to put the control of the narrative in Leah's hands. Um, I've always advocated for her and encouraged her to speak for herself, but even this was different. Um, the 2021 trajectory, she asked to do that. This meant that she was thinking this way. And I think that's really far more important if you're not using the, the paper having thinking that way is just empowering. Um, it made both of us aware that our needs um, are changing as we age. So we discovered things we didn't anticipate. Um, where she lives now actually provides the support she needs. Um, technology gives her exceptional safety and remote support and remote supports that she has really keep her um, in her routine. That we both speak and plan now using the same language, it means that the framework really shapes both of our, uh, both of our lives in, in big and small ways. Um, she's currently thinking about what she's gonna do with her day. So we'll be pulling the tools out again. Um, but we did have a breakthrough and, and it, was really, it was really kind of a, a hoot. Um, it's a tool that gives Leah control I only wish that while my mother was planning for Leah, that she had had access to something that helped her to see beyond just what she knew. And that's all I have. Thank you. Lynn, thank you so much. Emma? Hello. Um, for those of you I haven't met or been in a breakout room with yet, my name is Emma Schaus Garten. Um, my day job is in communications at Tennessee's Council on Developmental Disabilities. And I feel very lucky that I get to lead, um, as a part of that role, lead Tennessee's SLN chapter, which is called TAB, Tennessee Adult Brothers and Sisters. I'm also um, co-chair of the SLN chapter development committee. So those of you in states without an SLN uh, chapter already, please feel free to, to reach out. Um, post-conference and we'll get a conversation started. 
Um, so what brings me to the charting the life course conversation um, is how I have been able to, um, through my job at the council, learn about the life course framework um, and begin using um, these concepts and tools to really transform my expectations of um, what is possible for my brother. Um, so I have two uh, younger brothers who are twins, Evan and Brendan. I'm 32 and they're 25. We all live in the Middle Tennessee um, area uh, within like 30 to 40 minutes of each other. Um, uh, Brendan, uh, Evan's twin, work, doesn't have disabilities. He works in um, a nursing home rehab facility as a social worker. Um, and Evan is um, lives in his own apartment with uh, Medicaid waiver support services. Um, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> uh, is just a, a, a wonderful young man. For me, the... Um, the life course tools have really helped me personally articulate the things that I want for Evan, um, get my thoughts organized and down on paper, and then communicate those ideas and hopes and dreams to my parents and all of the folks supporting him. Um, I was finding, I, I mean, I, the second I learned about life course tools, I was I was very intrigued and and connected with them immediately. But I they became something I really relied on as I realized that because Evan is non-speaking, um, he has uh, autism and intellectual disabilities and other behavioral health diagnoses. Diagnoses um, because Evan doesn't speak, his planning meetings, his IEP meetings, and support planning meetings were all my parents talking for him um, and other people uh, in, in his life talking about him and no one really talking to him. Um, and so those meetings became really stressful for me because I felt like I needed to do everything as I could as a sister to kind of shift the, the dynamic in the room um, to be centered on him fully, um, to creatively think about ways we could, as a team, give him choices to be making choices about his own life in those settings um, and to really, you know, do plain language translations for him so he understood the things that we were talking about or the decisions that, that folks were making. Um, but in this kind of support person accommodation role meant I had no brain space to contribute my own ideas. So, um, which are often very different than my parents' ideas. Um, so Life Course Tools became really a helpful tool for me to just, um, be, again, be able to articulate that vision. So I'm gonna uh, just really quickly go through, this is a trajectory that um, I did um, for Evan. Again, kind of my own understanding of, of what um, uh, is, is best for him, what makes him the happiest and the most lit up and the most content and satisfied. Um, this was during the COVID pandemic. He had had, as most of our siblings, I think, had a really hard time um, with, with the disruption in routine. And we decided we needed to have a person-centered planning team meeting to see, okay, what needs to change. So, um, Barb, if you wanna go to the next slide. So my vision for Evan's good life is that he continues living in this apartment um, or at some point maybe a home of his own with the right kind of supports and staff who work well with him. That he sees and does fun outings with our family regularly, at least monthly with me and weekly with mom and dad. You may notice that his twin brother isn't on that right now. I am hopeful that at some point um, Brendan you know, he just has a very different relationship with Evan as his twin um, and is still kind of on his own sibling journey. So they are not, you know, super active in one another's lives right now. But um, I have no doubt he'll, he'll, you know, be a more active member of, of Evan's support circle at some point. Um, that he gets to go swimming at least once a week indoors or outdoors, um, goes hiking and on walks. I would really love for him to start um, doing therapeutic uh, horseback riding again. 
Um, <laughs> and I would love him to find a job um, where he is really appreciated and gets to use his talents and he enjoys it. Struggling right now with low expectations all around, unfortunately, when it comes to employment, but I'm, I keep uh, plugging away <laughs> every, every planning meeting, encouraging us to think creatively about it. Um, Barb, you can go ahead and move on. I want to make sure Stephen has enough time. Uh, what I don't want, I don't want him to feel unhappy, feel a lack of control over his life or schedule. I don't want him to have meltdowns or experience self-injury or fear or danger, poor mental health or anxiety. I don't want him to stop growing and getting to try new things or to feel bored or unsatisfied. I don't want him to stay inside all day or just killing time with staff being taken on errands. <laughs> feel lonely to have health problems. And I'll say in this safe space that this whole list is like what his days were like during the pandemic. So this was my way of saying, hey, you know, none of this is not ideal. Something needs to change, but hopefully in a positive, <laughs> constructive way. Um, uh, this is just uh, some, some of my thoughts about past life experiences in his recent past that have been helpful and harmful and then uh, keep, and then um, using that middle column moving forward to think um, about what um, now in, in the pandemic and beyond what he could be doing um, differently that could help him get to that vision of a good life. Um, so that includes continuing music therapy. Um, we have done this now, uh, provided Evan's staff and activities and outings list of places he could places he enjoys and then new places to try. I think sometimes, uh, Barb, you know, you said the you always see the going to Walmart, going to McDonald's and going to Dollar Tree is um, apparently Evan's favorite activity and place to go in the whole world, which I didn't know in 20 years of living with him, but uh, <laughs> no, uh, but really trying to figure out as a family ways that we could um, support staff and, and thinking more creatively because Evan's not going to say verbally, hey, here's a, you know, here's a movie I want to go see, or he loves going to plays, like we have the financial, you know, ability to, you know, help send him to uh, the theater once, you know, a couple, every couple months or something, um, you know, just to encourage staff um, to think uh, outside of the box of, of how to spend his, his days. Um, and then I just want to, no, it's okay, Barb, you can stay here. Um, and I just wanted to share also that, um, you know, we've, we've said all along that none of these tools are disability specific. You can use these tools for yourself. Um, they don't have to just be, you know, for a, for a loved one or a family member who needs an extra level of support. I have um, an anxiety disorder. And um, I found that the support star really helped me kind of get down on paper. Okay, what supports um, in terms of my personal strengths, my relationships, um, eligibility things that I may qualify for through my health insurance or because I'm a state employee um, in, in my community and technology? What am I um, already kind of tapping into and what could I plan? Um, so you'll see this support star is divided into current and future. If I'm thinking about expanding the kinds of um, supports all around that support star to um, manage daily anxiety even better, um, what, uh, what are some of the strategies? And you may see on there, um, a goal uh, for this year was strengthening relationships on and offline with fellow siblings of people with disabilities. So I feel like I uh, am marking that one off <laughs> through this conference. So um, I will go ahead and pass it, pass it over to Stephen, but I'm happy to answer any questions in the chat or, or later. Emma, before Steve goes, thank you for showing us a way um, to complete and put down our thoughts on behalf of our brothers and sisters that may not be able to share their vision like Leah could. So awesome example. Thank you so much, Emma. <clears throat> and Steve, I think you are up. Uh, thanks so much, Barb. And, and thanks to Emma and to Lynn uh, for all your stories, all your insights. Um, 
you know, it doesn't matter how many times I hear these stories, I, I just always learn so much. And so I'm so grateful to be on a panel with all of you uh, and, and for everything that you've shared. Thanks to SLN for the opportunity to, to share here with, with fellow siblings. This is an amazing opportunity. Uh, I can't thank you enough either. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Steve Beha. I work for the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities. Um, I work in the Division of Policy and Strategic Direction. Uh, but the, the main reason why I'm here today with all of you is that I am Matthew's oldest brother. Um, I am the oldest of five siblings. Matthew comes right behind me and we have three other younger siblings. Uh, Matthew was not born with a developmental disability. He contracted uh, encephalitis at the age of two, uh, spent about seven weeks in children's hospital, part of that time in a coma. And it's uh, been a journey ever since that point in time. I will say that, you know, my entire professional career, uh, I mean, I, I think everybody knows our lived experience as siblings impact our professional careers, but my entire professional career has been within the field of developmental disabilities. And during that time, I really, you know, I find it fortunate to be able to influence policy and in different types of directions that in my various jobs through that sibling lens, because I don't know that we get that all the time. So, uh, thanks, Barb. You can go to the next one. So you heard about the framework and the tools from personal experiences from everybody that, that just presented, uh, how they can be used to support families uh, and how they've supported each and every one of their families individually. What I kind of want to focus on, what we've done at, at, in Ohio, is to look at how do families learn about the framework that is designed to support them. And so how do we actually get this framework and these tools into the hands of families? Uh, and, and I'll give you some examples here in Ohio. What we're gonna do is, is talk about the Ohio Family Network. And I'm gonna be dropping some links into, um, into the chat for folks to follow along if you would like to. Try and pull that up real quick here. So the Ohio Family Network um, is a part of the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities. And I'm fortunate to work there. Uh, what's different in Ohio than most states is that our department sits as a cabinet level um, divi or department. And so we have a director that reports uh, directly to the governor's office. So we have a great level of influence uh, on that level. Uh, and, and saying all that, our director um, and our department as a whole uh, through previous administrations as well, has been very supportive of any type of family support that we've done. And recently what we've done is kind of reorganize our website, especially in the family realm around the various uh, charting the life course domains. So I know we're a little bit short on time. Thanks Barb, we can, yep, right there is good. <laughs> so what we really, I don't, don't have to tell any of you on this call or on this uh, conference here today, the, the need for a family network. What is it that, what's the problem that we're trying to solve? What are the things that, that families need out there? Uh, you can see some of theirs on there. We know it's hard. We know families need services, they need support, they feel isolated, um, and they need a pathway to information, to connection and support. Go ahead, Bart. So what we would need to do is we needed to build a network that would support families in that way. And so we put some funding together, put out a request for proposal for family organizations. And this part of it was really important to us that the funding go to organizations that were led by family members, whether that be grandparents, parents, people with disabilities themselves or siblings. We wanted to make sure that those organizations that were receiving this funding were living the life as, as it were. Um, and so we need to, to make sure that the funding was going to those type of organizations. Go ahead, Barb. Thank you. And what we did when we built the RFPs or when we started sending out um, information about it is we wanted to make sure people knew that these networks were gonna be built on the Charting the Life course framework. So you see those three buckets there, Barb mentioned them earlier. We wanted every one of these networks to provide or fill up families in these three ways, in these three buckets. So we made sure our deliverables were based in trying the life course framework. And we also were very um, intentional about them expanding access to 
non-disability specific community resources. So anything that anybody can access in their community. So that's not a disability specific uh, resource for them to do. So that was really important to us. Go ahead, Barb. Another thing that was really important to us is to make sure that we were providing targeted outreach to communities that are generally underserved in our population. At least in Ohio, we don't have a program that necessarily goes out and knocks on doors and asks, do you have somebody with a disability living with you? It, for us, people come to us and knock on our front door. And so for us, it was really important that we provide outreach, that these family networks provide outreach to low income populations, non English speaking populations, minorities, people living in the rural areas of the state. So that was really important. The other thing that we wanted to make sure that we had were resources available. So it wasn't just the family organizations having to come up with everything on their own. So we decided to, to create or fund three uh, resources for them to use. Go ahead, Barb. So the resources that we funded were families at the center of a connected community through an organization called Starfire. Uh, Soulbird and Profluence uh, provided us with Growing Family Resilience, which is a, a um, trauma-informed care series. And then the one you see there in the middle is Charting the Life Course. We've, we've been a part, uh, Ohio has been a part of the National Community of Practice for Supporting Families since 2016. Uh, and so we've been fortunate to be a part of that since then. We have great partners in Ohio DD Council and both of our USEDs at the University of Cincinnati and the Ohio State University Nysonger Center. And so as, as Project Lead Partners, we've had um, many years to, to work through building the foundation of trying the life course in Ohio. And this was just kind of the next step of that. Go ahead, Barb. So I'll just touch on these briefly. Growing Family Resilience is really a trauma-informed care approach for families um, who oftentimes don't feel like they've necessarily experienced trauma. But these are tools and strategies that they can use. Uh, we, we kind of shied away from saying it's self-help, but it, it really is a way for families to um, think about things a little differently. And we were, we were fortunate enough to be working um, with a couple of different organizations and actually translated the whole series into Spanish as well. So both of those versions are on our website. Go ahead, Barb. The other one that uh, is families at the center of a connected community. Um, so this one is all about uh, families really being hyper local with their neighbors, with the businesses that are in their local either neighborhoods or small towns or, or even a, a neighborhood within a large urban area. So it's learning new ways of discovering, activating, uh, sharing the gifts of your community um, I don't have a whole lot of time to go into this one, but the, the work that Starfire is doing around that is really, really neat. And we thought it was really important that all the families receive that support as well. Go ahead, Barb. All right. And then this one is the one that really is our outreach to families throughout the state when it comes to charting the life course. The Family Resource Network of Ohio is, um, is a website used to share information, um, to share uh, resources, trainings. Uh, it's where families and organizations can um, request trainings from folks like Barb or other ambassadors across the state. Uh, it's a really great resource and, and another way that we've um, kind of spread Charting the Life course through these networks. So the, the work actually involved that each of these organizations did, um, they've done everything from community conversations, transformational sessions, workshops, trainings, self-advocacy. One organization came up with a, um, a leadership series where it was a year long uh, series of almost like a partners in policy making, if you're familiar with that, um, that they built specifically for Ohio. You see the social media groups. Um, many of them hired family coordinators, so actually giving family members um, leadership roles within the family organizations to lead uh, the different activities in the counties. Um, 
help desk. One organization already had a help desk, but this helped them see that they had a large Spanish speaking community that they weren't uh, having a whole lot of impact with. And so they created a Spanish speaking help desk as well, specifically for the DD community. So really neat things in those areas. So the, we, we kicked this off in January of 2020 uh, with stars and rainbows and unicorns in our eyes, uh, knowing that you know the next 18 months were gonna be just the most amazing thing that we had ever uh, seen. And then of course, we all know what happened in March and while it was difficult, what we really saw was this pivot from what we thought was going to be a hyper local asset based community development type program to these family organizations really embracing the online formats and providing their supports not only to their local communities, but providing them statewide. And so even though it was difficult to do some of it virtually, it really opened it up to our entire state to, to get a lot of the information that we thought was really important. And this last one here is just the map of Ohio and where the family networks are, are located. You can definitely go to our website, uh, check out everything that they're doing and, and connect with them directly. Uh, I know that was short and sweet, but again, I really appreciate the, the opportunity to do this and I'll kick it back over to Barb. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> Thank you for not only sharing the information tonight and, and giving people food for thought. What can we do in our state? What are some possibilities? Um, but also the support that you have provided in the leadership in Ohio um, to support families in a more formal way and to help those family networks grow. And, and I say this, um, because I've had the opportunity to share information with families, but also it's a great, I've just seen such amazing things in Ohio with families. So thank you for your leadership in providing those opportunities. Um, again, all of the resources we shared with you are on lifecoursetools.com. Please check out the websites that Steve shared with you. There are videos um, available to anybody. Um, and please, 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 please look at those resources. We are not gonna do a breakout room, but here's our contact information and I'm gonna turn it back to Amy. Yes, <laughs> because we are at time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Barb and Steve, Lynn and Emma. You guys, uh, we're so grateful for the information and the stories and examples that you provided for us tonight. Really powerful information and um, I think some great tangible information that we can all go home and, and um, talk with our families about. So um, thank you so much for your time and your um, effort and thank you to everyone who joined us. Uh, Katie's going to put in the chat box um, our, the link to our conference evaluation. Um, we would be happy to get your feedback to hear how you feel about not only this session, but any part of the SLN conference. Um, we are asking people to complete it at the final time that they're attending our conference. So if you're coming tomorrow, you can fill it out tomorrow. But if this is your last session, then please fill it out um, this evening. Uh, and just as a reminder, we do have the one more, um, the finale uh, post-conference session is tomorrow night. Um, on June 24th, and you can still register for that. Uh, that session is called Sibling Support in International Context, which will be a panel of international siblings from different sibling organizations across the globe. Um, so uh, the link is in the chat box there. Um, but it was just wonderful to have you all here. Thank you for joining us. Have a great night and please, please keep in touch and stay connected. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Steve and Lynn and Emma. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Katie and Amy, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. It was good to be with everybody tonight. It was. Take care. It was. Take care. Take care. Bye.